Hello, and welcome to this uh, more extensive version of the talk I will be giving at the conference Quasars and Galaxies Through Cosmic Time. My name is Julian Wolf. I'm a third year PhD student at the MPE in Dachin, Germany, uh, where my research is being supervised by Paul Nandra and Mara Salvato. I'll be talking about our search for extremely rare X-ray luminous high redshift quasars with Erosita. So when we observe soft X-rays at about 1 keV from distant quasars close to the epoch of ionization, what we're actually measuring is their intrinsic uh, rest frame hard X-ray emission. In other words, the soft X-ray emission we measure is a less absorption bias tracer of accretion onto supermassive black holes through cosmic time. Uh, and indeed, measuring the space density of X-ray selected AGM can help constrain models of supermassive black hole formation and evolution. This is best illustrated by this figure from Vito et al. in 2018, where you have the black hole accretion density, which is solar masses for the years, the megaparsec cube, as a function of redshift. So the black hole accretion density, a uh, tracer of accretion through cosmic time, uh, can directly be derived from the X-ray luminosity function, uh, the XLF, which measures the space density of X-ray selected AGM as a function of the luminosity of redshift. So V2 et al. obtained this black data points from the Chandra deep fields, which they compared to these blue lines, which are theoretical predictions uh, from various supermassive black hole seed and evolution models. In other words, um, generating a census of X-ray selected high redshift quasars can help constrain and understand uh, progenitor models of supermassive black holes, such as, for example, population free stars or direct collapse scenarios. Now let's have a look at the numbers. There are currently about 450 uh, redshift greater than 5.5 quasars that have been discovered in dedicated optical and near infrared surveys. Of these 450, less than 50 have been X-ray detected so far. And this mainly via follow-up observations and campaigns with Chandra and XMF. As you may have heard, Erosita is currently performing a survey of the entire scan of the entire sky, which is quite a soft X-ray sensitive. And as a matter of fact, it has it has just completed its fourth full scan. With Erosita, we hope to uncover the full population of the most X-ray luminous quasars right at the end of the epoch of reionization around redshift 5.7 to 6. For this, our strategy is twofold. First, we are looking in the detections of previously known high redshift quasars, already spectroscopically confirmed high redshift quasars, in the Erosita data. But the core of our work really resides in the search for new X-ray luminous sources in the Erosita or Sky Survey, which we from now on, I'm going, I'm going to call ERAS in this talk. For the detection of high, previously known high redshift quasars, uh, I'm going to focus on the EFEDS field. This is a survey of about 140 square degrees, uh, which is contiguous and homogeneous, and was observed early on during the performance verification phase of the instrument. It was observed at the expected final depth of the Erosita or Sky Survey. To give you a feeling an idea of the parameter space we're going to probe, I'm showing on the right panel here the hard X-ray luminosity versus the redshift for a near complete sample of spectroscopically confirmed X-ray detected high redshift quasars. The color map you see in the background shows the final Erosita sensitivity, uh, which was computed assuming a uh, simple absorbed power law model for the X-ray spectral shape of AGM. Now, you may notice these two white points on the top of this distribution quite isolated. These two sources are actually Erosita detected quasars. They were detected by Medvedev et al. and Koronz et al. Uh, on the Russian hemisphere of the Erosita survey. And with our project, we hope to further probe this extreme region in luminosity redshift configuration space. As a matter of fact, earlier last year, we have already uh, reported the EFEDS detection of a luminous uh, radio loud quasar, uh, which was initially discovered in SDSS by uh, Fanetal. It lies at redshift 
In this paper, we argued that the detection of this quasar in the contiguous homogeneous effect field was indicative of a flattening of the X-ray luminosity function, the SLF, uh, beyond its break luminosity at higher redshifts. So we're looking at a XLF slice here, if you will, with the space density on the y-axis versus the hard X-ray luminosity uh, seen at redshift six. I'm uh, presenting samples drawn from XLF models from literature extrapolated out to redshift six and color coding these samples here uh, by the Poisson probability of supporting at least one detection at this high redshift and high luminosity. As you can see, flatter slopes are preferred. Or in other words, the space density uh, of extremely luminous, X-ray luminous high redshift quasars might be higher than what has previously been or is currently predicted by XLF models. We have recently also investigated another source in the effects catalog, which is of very low detection likelihood, but seems uh, astrometrically matched with a shell Q quasar at which of 6.56. So this HSC shell Q quasar was initially discovered by Max Wuppertal in 2018 and has the peculiarity of being one of the most Lyman alpha luminous quasars at these high redshifts. So we have obtained the most probable optical legacy DRA counterpart for this uh, X-ray source uh, using the Bayesian cross-matching algorithm N-Wave. This optical counterpart matches the shell Q quasar within one arc second. So something that really intrigued us were the, um, the near-infrared spectral properties of this quasar. Yang et al. recently published the near-infrared spectrum of the source, which shows a very narrow MG2 line. From the derived properties, it looks like this quasar is accreting at super Eddington rates for a relatively modest uh, black hole mass. And these properties typically remind us of uh, narrow line CFET objects in the local universe. So the X-rays we might have picked up with Eurozeta uh, could indeed be dominated by coronal activity by, the, by strong accretion. Because of the low detection likelihood in the Eurozeta catalog and simultaneously the low probability of chance alignment of a background fluctuation with this quasar, we decided to propose a Chandra follow-up observation of this quasar. We obtained a 21 kilosecond GTO follow-up uh, and can confirm uh, the detection of the quasar in the Chandra images. Moreover, there seems to be no other X-ray source in the direct vicinity of the quasar. While we're still in uh, a low count statistic regime, the flux we derive from the Chandra events is completely consistent with the Eurozeta EFEDS catalog fluxes. So the confirmation of this second source in EFEDS really increases the tension between the data uh, and the integrated um, source count uh, expectations from XLF models. And we are currently exploring this tension in a paper which will uh, be submitted soon. Let us move on to uh, the bulk of our work, the search for new X-ray luminous quasars. For this task, we have focused on the des dera 2 footprint uh, and have developed an entirely new selection pipeline. This selection pipeline consists of three selection stages. Um, the first one is a classical but relatively loose color selection in des dera 2 We then pass on this color preselected samples to a set of uh, independent filters on the one side, we have a photometric redshift computation using complementary infrared photometry. And the other side, we have a random forest spectral classifier. And I'll get back to this later. So these two filters yield a sample of 438 optical infrared high redshift quasar candidates, which we can then check against Eurozeta, our Eurozeta data, either by matching the quasar candidates directly to the ERAS preliminary catalogs or by performing force photometry at the optical position of these quasar candidates on the Eurozeta maps. I'm going to walk you through the building blocks of this pipeline. I'm start here with uh, the color preselection in the DS DR2 catalog. This relies on, as I was saying, relatively loose color magnitude criteria 
which aim at selecting quasars beyond redshift 5.7. You see this selection areas here in this color color plane, I minus Z, Z minus Y. The red points are spectroscopically known high redshift quasars detected in depth. I have also added uh, in yellow here, galactic cold dwarfs, uh, element T dwarfs, which are known to be the main uh, contaminants in color searches of high redshift quasars. Once we have pre-selected a sample, we can pass it through uh, our set of filters. The first filter uh, really aims at reducing uh, the, the, the stellar contamination in our search. It's a photometric redshift computation, very classic, uh, using uh, BEARS VHS and CAPWISE 20, 20 photometry, giving us access to optical to mid-infrared wavebands, essentially. So we compute photometric redshifts uh, using the code LEFAR and only keep uh, uh, ZFOT greater than 5.5 sources. Uh, we also require uh, that the best uh, QSO fitting model, or the best QSO model, uh, significantly outperforms the stellar model in the SED fit. The second filter we have developed is a random forest spectral classifier. This is a machine learning uh, classification scheme which uh, aims at mapping photometric features to spectral classes. We have trained this random forest on DSDR2 and CatWise 2020 aperture photometry, but also morphological and crop promotion uh, features. Our training set uh, included high redshift quasars, element T dwarfs, but also intermediate and low redshift quasars from the SDSS PR 16Q survey uh, in order to tackle the issue of contamination by lower redshift redden quasars. So once we've trained this model, we can evaluate it on an independent test set. And this is shown here with this confusion matrix on the right, where you have the true label versus the predicted ones. And as you can see, our model reaches very high precisions in the classification and a very high purity in the selection of high redshift quasars. Once we have trained and evaluated the model, we of course fit it, or we of course pass our um, best, best candidates, which were color pre-selected, uh, through the random forest. And in this color color plane, you see these candidates color coded according to the random forest assigned probability of belonging to the class of high redshift quasars. Once we have filtered our sample, we can finally check for an erosita detection. And this step is essential because it gets rid of another source of contaminants, which are uh, normal, highly redshifted galaxies. So we check for, for a, a detection by uh, matching our best candidates uh, or best Yes, optical near infrared candidates to our ERAS CatWise 2020 counterpart catalog that we have previously obtained also using NWAY, uh, this uh, patient pass matching uh, framework. We have in parallel uh, performed force photometry at the optical position of the quasars on the Erosita maps. We have computed the binomial no source probability and only kept candidates for which the probability of being a background fluctuation was extremely low. Out of this sample of selected sources, we have selected nine high priority candidates that we have submitted to our uh, collaborators at the Magellan Clay Telescope for spectroscopic follow up. The goal, of course, being the confirmation, the spectroscopic confirmation of the high redshift nature of the sources, essentially using uh, the, absorption, the Lyman alpha absorption method. Out of these nine high priority sources, we can confirm the discovery of five new high redshift quasars, quasars at redshift six or so. Um, here you see the discovery spectra, as you can see, they're all bona fide high redshift quasars. Uh, and we have estimated the redshifts using uh, the absorption edge, but also line and beta, and uh, other emission lines uh, when available above the noise. An important note at this stage three of these five quasars already are matched to a source in the preliminary ERAS catalogs. That means we have access to a pipeline flux information for these sources. 
Now I'm showing you here uh, this move image uh, for two of these detected quasars in UA Rosita, in the stack UA Rosita image. Uh, and these are of particular interest because they are also detected in the radio wave bands uh, by ASCAP, in, more specifically in the VAST and RAX surveys. Uh, extracting the radio fluxes of these surveys, we computed the radio loudness parameter for these quasars, and both of these quasars are confirmed radio loud. Uh, this makes them um, part of a very select club of a handful of sources that are uh, at high redshift, but simultaneously radio loud and X-ray detected. And they form extraordinary, extraordinary laboratories to check uh, and to investigate the interplay between the corona, the disk, and the jet of these systems. Of course, if we really want to investigate a jet contribution to the X-ray output of these sources, we'll need better count statistics. And for this, we plan to submit these quasars for Chandra follow-up. Now let's, let us come back to this luminosity redshift plane and see uh, what, uh, how we complete the picture with our detections. The EFEX shell Q quasar really lies at the detection limit for us and is presumably only detected because of its high accretion state. The three brown points here are the three uh, discovered quasars for which we have an ERAS entry. As you can see, they really populate as expected, this region of extremely X-ray powerful quasars right at the end of the epoch of reionization. A useful diagnostic is to also look at their optical to X-ray properties by computing the alpha OX, which simply is this luminosity ratio, uh, which parameterizes the, spec the X-ray to optical spectral slope. Now, alpha OX is known to correlate with the UV luminosity for AGM, but by selection and because of the Rosita sensitivity, our sources at high redshift really lie at the high end of alpha OX at any given LUV, as you can see here. This means that they show an X-ray excess emission with respect to their optical emission and the bulk of the, uh, the bulk of the AGM population. So where does the X-ray excess come from? Uh, is it maybe from a jet contribution in the form of the inverse Compton scattering of CMB photons of the jet, or is it beaming? Or is it uh, accretion uh, or strong accretion, such as that seems to be the case for this EFED uh, shell Q quasar? Well, we are currently investigating this, and this will be published in a second paper, which will, uh, which will appear later this year. So summarizing, we have detected uh, a set of previously known high redshift quasars and EFETs that can be used to constrain uh, the AGN space density and thereby uh, the, the space density of accreting supermassive black holes. We have detected a shell Q quasar, which is optically faint but X ray luminous and typically shows uh, spectral properties of narrow line secret one uh, galaxy. I have also reported the discovery of five new quasars beyond redshift 5.5, which appear to be X-ray luminous, but have flatter alpha OX. Two of these quasars are, are radio loud. So what we are looking forward to is to propose these uh, new, the newly discovered quasars for Chandra follow-up. Uh, I also hope to perform a radio analysis to uh, determine uh, or to test the blazer hypothesis, for example. Uh, and of course, we're looking forward to uh, deeper cumulative Erosita or sky data to take fully advantage and harvest the power of this selection pipeline that we have developed and discover new X-ray luminous high redshift quasars. I thank you very much for your attention, for the time you've invested in this video. Uh, if you have any questions about this presentation, please feel free to drop me a line. Here's my email address. Uh, or to ask me directly on January 25th during the conference. Thank you very much. Goodbye.